doesn't surprise me. There's so much science involved. Certainly, people who love facts and love science and love history. Um, I think in many cases you end up collecting first what you really, what is really personal to you, and then over time uh, those areas of focus change once you become more and more of an expert on certain certain areas. could have been found 25 years ago for probably uh, a few hundred dollars. Nowadays it's going to go for ten to twenty thousand dollars depending on its uh, on what kind of condition it's in. Uh, and that's true for, for all rare maps. Um, very, very difficult to find atlases intact now where it used to be fairly easy, but there's a sub-community that uh, is described with no love lost called Breakers, who have determined, uh, uh, mostly print dealers, who have determined that uh, by breaking an atlas, taking it apart, uh, and selling the individual maps, it's worth substantially more, several times over, what the atlas itself was, would be worth to sell the atlas. The atlas may go for $20,000, but if you take out 250 maps out of there and sell them individually, uh, for even just a couple hundred bucks a piece, you're going to make a lot more than that. So, unfortunately, that trend over the last several decades by mostly print dealers has made uh, map collecting uh, kind of Splinter. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I come from kind of a, a geographic family, so we were all kind of obsessed with it over the years. Uh, my brother and I both, uh, my older brother and I both grew up uh, really studying geography as a hobby in that family. And uh, in fact, he's a professor of geography today out of Western Michigan and uh, has been for a couple of decades. And in my case, uh, it was just a personal hobby that just got a little bit out of hand. I just collected year on year and just uh, my wife and I just kept collecting maps until one day uh, we stumbled into the archive. Actually, my wife did uh, originally and uh, saw through a door, behind a door, behind a door and realized, oh my goodness, uh, what looks like an unbelievable number of maps. And uh, from that, I ended up uh, doing uh, collecting even more and then, uh, and then eventually managing the archive for museum projects. So in my case, it became very personal. Uh, eventually, my oldest son went to Cal Berkeley and got his degree in geography. So uh, the, the, the trend continues. But when it comes to a map, you're talking about a snapshot of history, which is really difficult to define in other ways. So it becomes a very personal collectible. A map is a flattened representation of cultural values. What you're seeing is a visual display of an evolution of world views. The impulse to make a map is an impulse to literally realize the world. Medieval maps are speculative world views, maps of what could be. Any map can be a statement of political and territorial hierarchy. The fact that maps are dying points to the arrogance of our age. Early maps had craft to them, human subjectivity. Maps are definitely a form of media. I guess the bottom line is, early maps, beautiful maps, were an expression of someone's worldview artistically reproduced. People dismiss them because they're artistic and subjective. Early maps weren't done under the umbrella of science. They were free to be creative, expressive, and beautiful. We are in an age of objectivity and digitalization. Personal expressions have become unimportant. The way we express ourselves is tempered by the context in which we find ourselves. New maps reflect an austere world. They are an expression of bleakness, a lack of romance and mystery. Now we want to understand and digitize everything, store everything. That's why I keep old maps around. Early maps are an expression of what we didn't know, an expression of honesty. Years down the road, they'll look at our maps, and God knows what they'll think.